we were just at dinner with Father Vince, and he said, if you give a talk on Jesus, 20 people come out, and if you give a talk on the devil, 200 people come out. And, uh, yeah, so here we are. Well, welcome. My name is Jared Ortiz. I teach Catholic theology in the religion department, and I'm the director of the St. Benedict Institute. We're very pleased to be hosting tonight's talk by Father Vince Lampert. And we'd like to thank our co-sponsors, Campus Ministries, the Religion Department, and the Center for Ministry Studies. In the introduction to the screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. The that's those people over there. <laughs> Lewis continues, they themselves, the devils, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or magician with the same delight. And I have met people who fall into both camps. There are those who think the devils are outdated, and we who are enlightened should not give them any credence. While there are others who dabble in the occult or who carelessly accuse others of having demons. But in the spirit of Lewis, we want to offer a clear, sober, and biblical discussion of the power of evil. That's why we're delighted that Father Vince Lampert could join us. Father Vince is a pastor at St. Malachi Catholic Church in Brownsburg, Indiana. He is also the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. Tonight, he will speak on the biblical roots of exorcism and its meaning for ministry today. Please help me welcome Father Vince Lampert. It's always a great sign of faith when you clap for somebody before you hear them speak, because <laughs> you're not sure what's about to come out. I want to thank all of you for coming out this evening. When uh, Jared Ortiz invited me to come up to Hope College, I'm often asked to give different talks at different places, but I thought coming to Hope College, particularly during this year, would be a good thing to do because it's the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And I thought it would be a good opportunity for us to have a shared dialogue about the ministry of exorcism. And I believe that a good place to begin was to look at the biblical roots of exorcism, this ministry, and then to talk a little bit about the ministerial approach to exorcism, how it's practiced today. So after my presentation, there'll certainly be an opportunity. If you would like to ask any questions, I would be happy to entertain those. So belief in the existence and activity of evil spirits is a common religious fact within many different cultural traditions. At the same time, there are those who reject the notion of demons believing that the existence of evil spirits, along with the likes of exorcism and demon possession, come out of a primitive, superstitious worldview as a relic from the time of Christ, as a throwback to the Middle Ages. For some people, to even talk about demons is an embarrassment. For these people, evil is something of our own making. Oftentimes, people will say that evil is nothing more than humanity's inhumane treatment of one another. But the rejection in the existence of demons does not make them any less real or imaginary. In fact, the negation of the spiritual world is not a trait of the modern world. With the Pharisees and the majority of the Jewish people of his day, our Lord shared a conviction concerning the existence of spiritual creatures, whereas the Sadducees rejected the belief in the existence of such things. In the Christian tradition, it is biblical revelation that consistently confirms the truth of the existence of evil spirits, the chief of which is referred to as the devil or Satan. The word devil comes from the Greek word diabolos, which means adversary, slanderer, opposer. It occurs 33 times in the New Testament. The word Satan comes from the Hebrew and means accuser. It occurs 34 times in the New Testament. 
Another term used for Satan is Lucifer. Satan is a morally wicked creature, hostile to both humans and God. This wicked creature is also named by his maleficent activity. He is branded as the evil one 12 times throughout the New Testament, and the final plea in the Lord's Prayer is to be delivered from him. He is also the enemy, the adversary, the one who sows weeds in the field. As the enemy, he is the Antichrist par excellence. Depending on the form his malice takes, he is described as a liar and the father of all lies, and a murderer from the beginning, since his lying led humanity into sin and death. Inasmuch as he draws humans into evil, the devil is the tempter or the seducer. Satan is also referred to as the enormous dragon and the ancient serpent in the book of Revelation. The original sin of the devil was the sin of pride. St. Augustine writes that pride is the disordered love of my own excellence to the point of contempt for God. St. Thomas Aquinas explains that it is impossible for a creature to cease being a creature so as to become equal to God in all respects. Satan, therefore, wanted to be like God, not by nature as an equal, but by resemblance. He wanted to be similar to God inasmuch as God, by nature, is an end unto himself. Therefore, in the words of John of St. Thomas, the devil used his free will, choosing to remain first in an inferior order rather than becoming one among others in a superior order. We might have heard the old classic line that people attribute to Satan, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. The book of Revelation declares that the dragon's tail swept down a third of the stars out of heaven and cast them to the earth. So Satan's sin involves the sin of many angels. We can say that his bad example influenced one-third of the angelic order, who then submit to Satan as their chief. St. Thomas Aquinas goes on to say that these fallen angels become demons and the slaves of the one to whom they have surrendered, namely Satan. Now, after the fall, the demons do not lose their angelic intellectual quality, but their minds are now darkened, depraved of the light of the wisdom that comes from God. Oftentimes, people will ask the question, is it possible for the devil or the demons to repent? And the answer is no. The free will of the demons stubbornly persists forever in evil, which is to say that they are forever fixed in their bad choice. They are incapable of repenting, and their chastisement is eternal. For demons, redemption is no longer possible. And why is this the case? Theologians suggest it is because God no longer offers them the grace that could, per se, convert them. For them, the hour of choice has passed. God does this because he respects angelic nature. Unlike humans, whose free will can change, an angel, by virtue of his purely intellectual nature, is situated from the start in the presence of all that he could know. So when God created the angelic order, they, re they received infused knowledge. They didn't have to go to Hope College to learn anything. Information was just placed in them, you could say, kind of like a computer being downloaded. So these demons were able to see all the consequences of the choice that they would make, even the fact that they would be banished from the presence of God for all eternity. And yet even with that knowledge, they still chose to rebel. So they are fixed from the start, totally and unchanging, on the object of their choice. A good example would be, as long as iron has been heated in fire, it's malleable. The blacksmith can give it one form or another, but once it is solidified, it can no longer change. So Aquinas goes on to say that it is the irrevocable character of their choice and not a defect in the infinite mercy of God 
that makes the fallen angel's sin unforgivable. When we read throughout the Bible, we know that the world that Jesus Christ came to redeem is saturated with demonic presence. Scripture gives many accounts about the reality of the devil and his baneful influence on humans. For example, in Mark's Gospel, there are 13 references to a personified Satan or to casting out demons. This includes four exorcisms performed by Jesus and four by his disciples. We are told in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit in power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Jesus shared this power and authority with his disciples, and every time he sent them out, he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And we can see accounts of that both in Matthew's gospel and in Luke's gospel. The church holds to the belief of the victory of Christ over the devil and demons, but also the struggle that continues over the course of human history. This struggle manifests itself in a very a variety of ways that includes the affliction of people, places, and things. We read in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 12, Now the salvation and power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of our Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them night and day before God. Rejoice then, O heaven, and you that dwell therein. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So Jesus described his mission as one of reconquest, an enterprise to wrest humanity from our servitude to Satan and to restore all of us to our rightful relationship with God, who is the end of all things. We are told in Luke's Gospel, 418, Jesus came to proclaim release to captives, to set free all those who are oppressed. So Jesus is the one stronger who overcomes the well-strong armed man, in other words, Satan, and despoils his goods. Jesus' mission, I would say, is one of exorcism. It is a battle against unclean spirits that disfigure the image of God, and as the Acts of the Apostle tells us, he went about doing good and helping and healing those who were oppressed by the devil. To consider only for a moment the Gospel of St. Mark, the first act of Christ's public ministry after his baptism and the calling of his first disciples was to expel the unclean spirit from a possessed man. That's Mark 1, verses 23 through 28. And the crowds marveled at what he had done because Jesus commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Then Jesus was preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Mark 1, 39. The unclean spirits, when they see him, they throw themselves down at his feet and they cry out, you are the son of God. So Jesus in his public ministry encounters demon after demon. They are a reality, and to this end, he mercifully confers on his disciples the power to cast them out. Luke 10, 18. I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. And Jesus says this to his disciples. When back from their mission, they rejoice because even the demons are subject to us in the Lord's name. The actual coming of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ is indeed inseparable from the fall of Satan. In other words, from the end of his dominion over humanity. We can go on to say that with the New Testament, the liberation of humanity from the control of Satan and humanity's transfer to the kingdom of God is a privileged expression of the work of salvation accomplished by Jesus Christ. 1 John 3.8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So from now on, 
each and every one of us has an intercessor in the person of Jesus Christ. But we know that the victory is not won without combat. Satan stubbornly insists on preventing the coming of the kingdom of God. Satan tries in the desert from the very beginning of Jesus' public life to divert him from his mission. We know that Jesus goes out into the desert where he prays and fasts for 40 days. And then who appears on the scene? Satan himself. We know that Peter will do the same later. And that's why Jesus says to him in Matthew 16, 23, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking as God does, but as humans do. Satan is the one who puts into the heart of Judas the plan to betray Jesus. And we know that he even enters into Judas. After tempting Jesus in the desert, we are told that Satan departed from him until an opportune time, Luke 4, 13. And when does that opportune time come again? It is at the crucifixion. Jesus is being crucified. The devil believes that this is now his moment of victory. But his moment of perceived victory actually becomes the moment of his defeat. Because unwillingly, he actually played into the plan of salvation that God had laid out. So Satan, thus conquered, begins a battle with the church, which is the seat of the kingdom of God. Satan does everything that he can to oppose the growth of the church. His desire would be to influence humanity to reject God as he has done. Satan stirs up persecutions and dissension within the church. We know that in 1 Thess- Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, that he obstructs Paul's missionary activity. He claims Christ's disciples in order to sift them, Luke 22, 31. He strives through temptation to separate every believer from Christ, to snatch the word from their heart, lest the person believe and be saved, Luke 8, 12. And so we are warned in 1 Peter 5, 9, your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, resist him, solid in your faith. Eventually, all of this maleficent activity will come to an end with the definitive banishment of Satan into the eternal fire, Matthew 25, 41. We can go to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Until that day, the Lord has given us the ministry of exorcism to help those who have fallen under the influence of Satan and his dominions. And this is there now where I want to talk a little bit about the ministry of exorcism today. And any time I speak about exorcism, I think it's important to define what is meant by the term because oftentimes people have a notion of what they believe it means based on their own research or perhaps shaped by going on the internet or watching certain movies. Who's been to see The Exorcist? Who likes to watch shows on paranormal activity and ghost hunting? So there are many sources out there that can shape our definition always like to remind people that just because you read something on the internet does not make it true. I hate to burst your bubble if that's a nuance for you. Much on the internet that has to do with exorcism is aimed at sensationalism. It really focuses on the power of evil rather than challenging people to think about the power of God and the authority of Jesus Christ and the power found within his name. So hopefully, when all of you leave here this evening, you won't go away with a greater fascination of evil, but you'll go away with a greater fascination with the power of God. Even in this ministry that I have done, and I was appointed to this back in 2005, 
by my local bishop in Indianapolis, the most important thing I believe that an exorcist does is to help people who are troubled or afflicted by evil to once again see the face of God in their lives. So it's not my goal to focus on evil, but to help people again who are afflicted to have a genuine encounter of the presence of God in their lives. I don't have any special powers or abilities. Whether you are a priest or a minister of some other church, it is Christ who works through us. You could say that he is really the exorcist and the one who is bringing relief into the lives of people who are suffering. So the word exorcism comes from the Greek word exorcismos, and it is a term that signifies an insistent request manifested before God or directed against demons. Literally, to exorcise means to bind with an oath. At its very core, exorcism is a prayer. It is a prayer that brings healing and peace to those who are afflicted by the evil one, allowing that person to be reconciled with God. It is a ministry of compassion. It is a ministry of charity. It is a ministry that must be well done because it's not a hobby and it's not a game. When God is being requested to expel a demon, it is called a supplicating or minor exorcism. Prayers for deliverance would fall under this category. When the demon or evil spirits are being addressed, it is called an imperative or a major exorcism. So again, major exorcism, the demons are being addressed. A minor exorcism, God is being addressed, asked to intervene in the life of the person who is suffering. The role of the exorcist is to investigate cases of alleged demonic activity and to make the determination if the prayers of exorcism need to be called into play. Even with this said, it needs to be stated that the exorcist should not be the person's first line of defense. Exorcists should only see those who truly need their help. Many people who believe they need to see an exorcist can have the majority of their problems resolved by going to see their local priest or the local pastor of their church. It's important to note, even though I'm a Catholic priest, the Catholic Church does not have a monopoly on the practice of exorcism. It is a charism that's found within the entire Christian church. But it is the local pastor that should be the first contact, and the pastor should use discernment, listening to the person, assessing where that person is at spiritually, to pray with that person, and to offer that person a blessing. And if need be, either to say some prayers of exorcism or to contact the person who has more skill or knowledge in that area. Exorcism, I believe, should always be seen within the wider scope of overall pastoral care. It isn't just a matter of somebody who's afflicted with evil to come to see me, for example, for me to make their problem go away through this ministry that I've been asked to do, but one has to invite Christ more fully into their life. Now, demonic activity is classified under two main categories. It can be ordinary or extraordinary. Ordinary demonic activity would be temptation, something that all of us can struggle with on a daily basis. Extraordinary demonic activity is classified under four main categories. I'll tell you what they are, and then I'll comment briefly on them. Demonic infestation, demonic vexation, demonic obsession, and then demonic possession. So demonic infestation would have to do with the presence of evil uh, in a location or associated with an object. Demonic vexation would be the action by the devil and demons aimed at attacking and harassing humans physically. So vexation would be physical attacks. This would include scrapes or bites or markings on a person's body. The third type of extraordinary demonic activity is demonic obsession. 
and these are mental attacks against a person, whereby thoughts of evil are persistent in a person's mind, and even though they try to push them aside, they just keep coming back again and again. So thoughts of evil constantly fill a person's mind. And then we have demonic possession, whereby the devil or some other demon will take control of a person's body, treating that body as if it were its very own. When somebody is demonically possessed, the distinction should always be made between the demon once it manifests and that particular person as a human being. The tradition of the church has maintained four criteria in evaluating the validity of cases of demonic possession. These criteria include the ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual. Think about the intellectual quality again of the angels when they were created. They don't have to go and study Spanish or Latin or Italian or any other language. They can just speak it. The second type would be exhibiting extraordinary strength beyond the normal capacity of the individual. The, thir the third criteria, elevated perception. A person has knowledge about things that they shouldn't otherwise know. And finally, a strong resistance to anything of a divine nature, such as being in a sacred space, being in the presence of the Bible, being shown a crucifix, holy water, and so on. It's also possible to know that an evil spirit is present when symptoms of the demonic are observed. And some of these we see throughout scripture. These include bodily contortions. We know in Mark 1, 26, it says the evil shook the man violently. A change in the voice there in Mark 5, 5. He would cry out and cut himself with stones. Three, change in physical appearance, such as foaming at the mouth, eyes rolled in the back of the head, anything of a animalistic nature, unpleasant odors, a change in the temperature of the room, uncontrollable laughing, hissing and the resemblance of the movement of a snake, and even levitation. All of these can be signs of demonic possession, but before proceeding with the rite, the Catholic Church utilizes a seven-step protocol. An exorcist in many ways is trained to be a skeptic, I should exhaust every other possible explanation for what is going on in the life of the person before labeling that person as possessed. I personally believe that if the church were to label a person as possessed and that label pre prevents the person from getting the true help that they need, then the church would be doing greater harm. Again, this is a ministry of charity, so the person has to hear what the truth is as opposed to what they might want to hear. The first step of the protocol is for the person to have a thorough physical examination. So the church wants to know, is there a physical explanation for why this person is acting the way that they are? So you would bring in medical doctors and other experts as needed. The second step of the protocol would be a thorough psychological evaluation by a qualified clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist. These experts are asked to, to weigh in on a person's case, basically saying whether or not there's something about this person's character that defies their own training and their own understanding. Because it is true that people who deal with mental health issues can also exhibit the same qualities that we see within people who are possessed. So we know that people who are schizophrenic, they can have audible outbursts. So again, the church wants to be very, very cautious before putting a label on someone and saying that they're dealing with the demonic. The third step of the protocol would be to take a life history of the person, identifying where the entry point of evil may have originated. Because identifying how evil entered into this person's life will allow the exorcist to know how to close that door, so to speak. 
The fourth step of the protocol is to normalize the spiritual life of the person. And this is usually the one thing that people don't like to hear from me. Oftentimes, people who are afflicted by evil merely want the exorcist to make their problems go away, but they don't really want to have any skin in the game, so to speak. So if I say to them, I can pray with you, but you need to invite Jesus Christ more fully into your life, because Christ is the one who will ultimately protect all of us from evil. I also know the fact, based on Luke's gospel, where it says that once the demon has been cast out, it comes back, finds the house swept clean. In other words, the void is now not filled with the presence of God, and then the demon goes and finds seven other demons worse than itself, and they come back, and that person's situation is worse than it was before. That's in Luke eleven twenty six. So it is important for the person to want to resume or to start for the very first time a relationship with Christ. You'd be amazed at people that I talk to. I probably receive about 20 calls and emails from uh, throughout the United States and other parts of the world every week. And when people tell me that they are afflicted by evil, the very first thing I tell them to do, you need to get to a local church in your area. You need to have someone begin praying with you and you need to begin praying. And they look at me like I'm, or they respond like I'm crazy. They're like, no, 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 what do you really want me to do? And I jokingly always say that if I were to tell them to go and get a dead cat and go out at midnight on a full moon and swing the dead cat around their head, they would look at me and go, where do I get the cat? <laughs> we don't have to do anything extraordinary to repel the evil one from our lives. It's the very ordinary things that we do that will keep the devil at bay. Go to church, pray. Those are the key and essential ingredients. The fifth step of the protocol would be to look for those four extraordinary signs of demonic possession that I mentioned earlier speaking languages otherwise unknown, superhuman strength, elevated perception, and then an aversion to anything of a sacred nature. The sixth step, because we live in the United States, is just to make sure that things are done according to Hoyle, because we all know that litigation is very popular in the United States. So the church does want to make sure that all legal and canonical processes are followed. And then once that's all clear, the very final step is to compile the case together and then to make the decision to perform a major exorcism. Now, genuine cases of demonic possession are rare. They are real. They do happen, but not very frequently. In the 12 years that I've done this ministry, I have done three major exorcisms. I've encountered people who I believe needed a major exorcism, but who chose not to receive the prayers of the church. Again, we all have free will, and as I said earlier, an exorcism cannot be prayed for someone against their will. But most of the cases that I deal with, not possession, but most of them are vexation, obsession, and infestation. Dealing with those types, there have been thousands of situations over the past 12 years. I always like to tell people, too, that demonic possession is not contagious. You don't have to go around and use hand sanitizer to, to try to kill it and to keep it away. If you watch Hollywood movies, people are always afraid that a demon is going to jump out of one person and into another. That cannot happen. We should never give the devil more credit than he is due. So that makes for a great Hollywood movie, but a devil is not free to do that. But one has to invite evil in, either directly or indirectly, and by doing so, they can open themselves up to evil. Sometimes people engage in activities that they believe are fun and entertaining, but in reality create a connection with evil spirits. So if I've identified seven main ways that I believe a person can open a doorway to evil in their lives. 
Certainly there are countless ways, but these are the seven dominant ways that I have seen over the past 12 years. They're not in any particular order. So ties to the occult. The word occult comes from the Latin word occultus, meaning hidden or secret, and it focuses on knowledge of the paranormal. It's associated with things like palm reading, going to see a median, playing with a Ouija board, tarot cards, psychics, practice of witchcraft, and magic. All of these things are condemned because they are a form of idolatry that violate the very first commandment that God gave us. And what is the first commandment? Pop quiz. I am the Lord your God. You shall not have strange gods before me. So when people get in involved in the occult, what they're basically saying is God is deficient. God is not enough. So I have to do these other things to fill that void in my life. We can go to the book of Deuteronomy there in the Old Testament, chapter 18, verses 10 through 12, where it says, you must never practice black magic, be a fortune teller, witch, or sorcerer. You must never cast spells, ask ghosts or spirits for help, or consult the dead. Whoever does these things is disgusting to the Lord. In the book of Leviticus 19.31, do not defile yourselves by turning to medians or to those who consult the spirits of the dead. People need to realize that the devil cannot be used by persons for our own benefit. The devil will always use them. So, for example, psychics and medians do not have the power or ability that they claim to have. It is the evil spirit working through them, and either they are ignorant to that fact or they become compliant with that, allowing the evil spirit to work through them because it gains them monetary gain or it gives them notoriety. Again, knowing the future and things like that, the only person who knows the future is God himself. The devil does not even know the future. Only God knows the future. And if people have a special charism to say that they, they can see what's going to happen, I always listen carefully and to hear whether they say, I have a gift, I have ability, or are they saying, God has given me this ability, God has given me this charism. There's a big difference, because when we use the word I, we're giving in to our ego, and we're giving in to the sin of pride, just like Satan himself. Another way that we can open up a doorway to evil is through mental man manipulation or brainwashing. So this happens when a person is targeted because they are in a state of need. So there may be groups that target individuals trying to brainwash them, making that person feel as if that group is the only group that they can trust. They should no longer trust their family, their friends, or anyone else, but only those who belong to that particular cult. A third way that one can open up a doorway to evil is through a curse. A curse is the opposite of a blessing. If something is blessed, it's commended to God. If something is cursed, it's commended to the devil. Now, curses are only effective if we are weak in our faith. We know in Psalm 91, we can put on the armor of God. And if we're wearing the armor of God, regardless of what somebody else is doing, because we cannot control what another person does. But as long as we know that we're standing right in the eyes of God, somebody may wish us ill will, but it will have no impact on us whatsoever. A fourth way that one can open up a doorway to evil is by being dedicated to a demon. That seems kind of far-fetched, doesn't it? Being dedicated to a demon. After I was appointed to be the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, I trained in Rome in the early part of 2006, where a priest there who was an exorcist allowed me to participate in 40 exorcisms that he performed during the time that I was there. 
And again, these were exorcisms that had to deal with infestation, vexation, obsession, and possession. They were not all cases of demonic possession. But there was a young lady there who told me that her problems began uh, because her mother had told her that when she became pregnant, she didn't want her. Her mother even tried to abort her, but then it wasn't successful. She was born. She said her mother told her as she grew older that she blamed God for giving her a child that she did not want. So she believed that she would get even with God by dedicating her daughter to Satan. So for the first 12 years of her life, she went through all kinds of different satanic practices and rituals. When she turned 12, she was able to run away from home. She ended up on the streets of Rome, and then she was there for six years. When she was 18, she found the priest that I mentored with who began to pray the prayers of exorcism with her, and then she was freed from all of that. She actually went on to dedicate her life to God by becoming a religious sister. So it is an indication that just because somebody is dealing with evil in their life doesn't mean that they're a bad person. We have to remember that every person is created in the image and likeness of God. And again, as I said earlier, we should always make the distinction between the presence of evil and the human person. A fifth way that one can open up a doorway to evil is through a life of habitual sin. It's whereby we lose the sense of sin. Things that are morally wrong, we believe are morally right. So we no longer live according to God's plan for us, but we begin to write what we believe to be true, even if those beliefs are contrary to what God teaches us in sacred scripture. A sixth way that one can open up a doorway to evil is by actually inviting a demon into your life or cultivating relationships with demons. One of the major exorcisms that I performed was on a woman who told me that she believed that someone she knew was possessed. So she said to the person, what's ever in you, I freely invite to come into me. A misguided form of charity. She said no sooner than the words came out of her mouth that she felt something come over her. In working with that particular person, uh, there were seven demons that named themselves in her. And the one dominant demon told me its name was the demon Leviathan, mentioned in the book of Revelation. And that during the prayers of the church, when the demon would manifest, the demon would say that it did not have to leave because it had been invited in. And since it had been invited in, it was trying to make a claim on the life of this person. But the ritual of exorcism, you could say, commands the demon to return what it has stolen, namely something which belongs to God, namely each and every one of us. The final way that I'll mention is through broken relationships. We all know that there's so much brokenness in society today, but it does seem to be important how we handle brokenness. Do we give in to anger, bitterness, resentment, revenge, or do we try to seek healing? Think for a moment of the story in chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel. It's the story of the Gerasene demoniac. Many of you might be familiar with the story. So Jesus is passing through Gadarene territory. There's a man living in the tombs who's possessed by legion. Shackles will not even hold him. There's the example of superhuman strength again. Jesus is walking by. Jesus begins to rebuke the demons. And then they ask to be sent into the swine, where they go into the swine, and then the swine race over the hillside, where they drown in the lake. Most people stop listening to that biblical account. But something very, very important happens. Because the man who is now free from legion wants to follow Jesus down the road. But what does Jesus say to him? No, go home to your family. How often throughout the Bible do we hear Jesus tell someone, don't follow me? So there's something very significant taking place. So go back to your family. A man who had been living with the dead in the tombs 
is now being placed back into a rightful relationship with his family. It is the belief that it was the brokenness within those family dynamics that brought about the presence of evil in the first place. The devil loves division and dissension, so it is important that we don't allow those things to get the best of us. In the 26 years that I've been a priest, hear all kinds of accounts about people who haven't spoken to each other in so long because they're just angry and they've allowed that anger to get the best of them. So if I make the determination that an entry point truly is valid, then this is where the rite of exorcism comes in. Demons have power. They can only be defeated by power. And exorcism is an encounter with a power that is greater than the demon. And God is that power, and exorcism is the method for calling upon God to come and bring salvation and relief into the life of this person who is suffering. And with that said, I would be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Yes. The devil can play on a person's memory and on their imagination. So putting these thoughts and ideas in your head, you could say that the devil will try to amplify those things to instill fear within you. What's one of the classic lines that we hear throughout Scripture? Be not afraid. But what does the devil want to do? He wants to instill fear. So I think sometimes when we put these notions in our minds if you go out at night now how many people are going to go home tonight and if you're walking <laughs> what was that was that a squirrel did somebody step on a stick so we we should not allow the devil to kind of get into our our heads so to speak yes two questions, two questions. all right That would be an example. She's asking a question about hypnotism. Somebody was doing it at a graduation party kind of as a fun or a game. I think the danger in that is that that goes back to indirectly opening yourself up to evil. You think it's fun, it's entertaining, but maybe you don't have a full grasp because the person who's hypnotizing you, what do you really know about them? You have no idea who they are. And so there is that danger. Sometimes even mediums and psychics, when you go to their office, they might give you a false sense of security. Maybe you go in there and maybe the, the Lord's Prayer is framed on the wall. There might be a cross on the wall. So you're thinking, ah, this is, there's no, no, there's no, no harm here. But all those could be used just to give you that false sense of security. When you remember, then you can ask me number two. Yes. Try to consult the souls of the dead. So the example that I would give is in the Old Testament. King Saul tries to conjure up the spirit of who? Samuel. And he goes to see the witch of Endor. And even Samuel says, why have you disturbed me? So it doesn't say that these things can't happen. God just tells us not to do these things. But even the witch of Endor was surprised. She was startled when it happened, so it was almost like she didn't even believe it. We don't consult the saints. From the Catholic tradition, you ask saints to be an inter for intercessory prayer, but we're not conjuring up... 
Correct. Yes. It is training. Yes, it can be because, yeah, you're dealing with all kinds of craziness, you could say. I, I was telling the, the group that I met with before that when after one of the major exorcisms I did, somebody asked me, well, what did you do afterwards? Did you, like, go pray for an hour? What did you do? And I said, no, I stopped at Dairy Queen on the way home. <laughs> it was a hot day. I was hot, tired, sweaty. The, the chocolate shake hit the spot. I will say it's important to have a good sense of humor in dealing with this because when you deal with people that are kind of on the fringes and are afflicted and suffering, it can consume you. So having a good sense of humor is important. There's a lady that works with me. She screens all the calls that I get and tries to say, you need to see these people, these you don't, and whatnot. So I, I always tell people I call her my ex or assistant. <laughs> see? A crazy sense of humor is good. Yes? There's only one God. We're back to the first commandment, so anything contrary to the first commandment would be, would be wrong. Yeah, no, I would say that there may be people that have deified other entities but it wasn't that they, those entities were gods, but other people identified them as gods. But I would say that Scripture very clearly tells us there is only one God. And where else in the... Okay. I think that we were having this discussion beforehand, too. I think there's, a, in, the, in maybe like in the West, Europe, the United States, people kind of doubt. But you get into the South. I was in South Africa earlier this year. There are places that readily accept spiritual realities. It's just a fact. They don't question that. Perhaps in the Western world today, we're more suspect. And we think, ah, you know, isn't there a pill that can be taken to resolve that problem? So I do think there's a difference on whether or not people readily accept spiritual realities or whether they discount them altogether. Go way to the back, yes. Well, the, the Catholic response to that, and that's the only one I know, so the Catholic response would be whether it's yoga or Reiki, that one can open themselves up to evil through those practices. Because, like for Reiki, for example, people are calling upon some energy or power. Well, what does that mean? Are you saying it's the Holy Spirit? If it ain't the Holy Spirit, then it's an unclean spirit. The same way with the practice of yoga, if people are cultivating practices that have to do with other forms of religious worship that are contrary to how we as Christians are called to worship, then the notion is that we can't open ourselves up to evil. And I've had people tell me that I think I've seen maybe churches that have Christian yoga or holy yoga where they're doing it just for the exercises and not because they're it's a form of religious expression. So I think one just has to be kind of cautious because you might begin with the best of intentions, but then maybe there's a slippery slope that you go down. You might begin just for the exercises, but then maybe 
you become intrigued by some of the religious expressions that have to go to, through that. Because even people will tell you that yoga, some of the poses and postures are a form of ancient prayer to some of these deities. The popularity of Harry Potter. I think it does. I think, well, Harry Potter, I think, has created a fascination with, with magic. And see, magic means that I want to have a certain power or control over you or over others. Now, a lot of people have read Harry Potter. A lot of people have seen the movies and all that. So you can't tell people, oh, act like you didn't do that. I think it's always important if people are going to watch certain movies or read certain books you should always filter it through your Christian faith. So if you're a parent and your children are reading these books or watching the movies, do you ever sit down and talk with them about why what they're reading or seeing is consistent or inconsistent with our Catholic belief? So I think you could actually use it as a teachable moment. So rather than just saying, avoid it, avoid it, avoid it, that's just going to create a more of a fascination with it. So it might be better to embrace it to some extent and then use it as a teachable moment to help people to grow more deeply in their faith. Yes? I get my request to give talks always increase around Halloween. Never, so she's asking if when people leave tonight, what's one thing you might take with you? Never put God and the devil on the same playing field. Never put God and the devil on the same playing field. God is so much greater. The devil is still a creature. So never believe that somehow they're equal counterparts. So the devil always wishes to portray himself as something more than he is. The roaring lion trying to scare and instill fear. I tell people I like to watch the Animal Planet shows, and when the, when the lion is stalking its prey, there's two types of prey it goes for. The one that we think that one is the weakest, and then if it goes after the strong, what has the strong one done? It's wandered off from the herd. It teaches us the importance of community, and the important role that other people play in our lives. Because there's a growing trend today where people will say, I don't need to go to church of any kind. I'm just spiritual on my own. But what these people are failing to recognize is the important presence of other people in our lives. Often remind people the Lord's Prayer does not begin, my Father who art in heaven. So when Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, our Father. So community is extremely important, and we shouldn't discount that. When, when you perform uh, exercises of the castration nature, how do you, what, what was the manifestation? How, did, I mean, how is it discerned uh, which space uh, or which place uh, It's important to note that demons don't live at a particular address. So it's not like, well, they live in that house and it's haunted. They're spiritual entities, so they don't exist in time and space as we understand it. That's why I always laugh when you watch these ghost hunter shows and they're going into a place that's haunted, when in reality it's the very thing that they're doing in the house that's causing the evil to manifest. So it's not like the demon lives at, I don't know, 666 Mockingbird Lane or whatever. <laughs> but it's what they're doing that's causing it. And then people have a manifestation or they just have a fascination. 
there was an exorcism that was performed by a priest in Gary, Indiana. They got a lot of notoriety a few years ago. And then the people that produced the movie The Conjuring purchased the house where strange things were happening. Well, what began to happen is that people were breaking into the house and doing seances and whatnot because they thought evil lived in the house. But they didn't realize that the things that they were doing, the seance and trying to conjure up the spirits of the dead, is what was causing the evil to manifest. The producers finally had the house torn down just to, to keep everybody away from it. Yes? So she's asking, can a demon attach itself onto you? So that would be cultivating that relationship. So, yeah, that could happen. So it's not like, oh, something bad's happened in this house. I think I, I'm moving. Because if it's connected with you, then no matter where you're at, it's going to be there. So if we're sealed with the Holy Spirit in baptism, how can we succumb to the demonic? If we turn our backs on God. And that goes back to what I said earlier, that exorcisms in the pagan world, if you will. So if people have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ and they're dealing with the demonic, the exorcisms are one and done. But in the apostate world, it seems to be different. So people who have heard the good news of Jesus Christ and then have decided to turn a deaf ear to it, it does seem that evil spirits make a greater claim on these people. Because they knew the truth, and then they said, no, thank you. Kind of reminds me of the judgment scene in, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus, they separate the sheep from the goats, and it says that the goats will get off with fewer stripes, because they, they could almost feign ignorance. But the sheep can't. Once you know the truth, you have to live it. You can't, why did I learn about that? You can't do that. So people that are still with the Holy Spirit, I think it's if they turn their back on God. Yes. So she's asking if you work in the mental health profession and you believe that someone that you work with or one of the patients, if you will, is dealing with the demonic, what do you do with them? How do you find them the help that they need? I think you begin to sit down, you pray with them, see if they want to pray, cultivate a relationship with them, and then to see if they're interested in finding true help. Because again, if there's that pastoral presence if you know that they're afflicted and you're there for them and you create a relationship, then you can be the one that might walk and journey with them to get the help they need. So the question is, she's making the comment, some people say Jesus knew that he wasn't casting out demons, but he was just playing up to the audience of the day who believed in these things. But now that we have a better understanding of mental health issues, why do we need this? I think when we look at what Jesus, when he sent his disciples out, he clearly gave them the authority to cast out demons and to heal people of their ailments. So Jesus makes a clear distinction between demon possession and health-related issues. So if Christ makes a distinction, then we should as well. Now, I thought you were going to ask the question, is it always mental health? Is it always the demonic? And boy, that's, that's, that's such a complicated area. That's why I believe that demonic obsession has to do with the mind. 
is the most difficult form of extraordinary demonic activity to deal with. I think it's more difficult than the demon possession. Because is it always one or the other? Or did somebody have an encounter with the demonic? Did the mind fracture as a way to try to understand that? That's why the church does want to rely on professionals in the mental health field to really weigh in, because that's an area you want to tread very, very cautiously, because again, could end up causing greater harm than good. Yes? Speaking in tongues, glossolalia would be a gift from God. And when somebody speaks in tongues, there's always should be somebody around who has the gift of interpretation. So it's the, the language of the Holy Spirit. So there is a difference between people speaking in tongues who have that charism and somebody that's... Because if somebody is speaking in tongues and one is interpreting, what do you normally hear? A person glorifying God. If somebody is possessed, I assure you, whatever coming out of their mouth is not glorifying God. So that would be, that would be the distinction. Yes. My thoughts on C.S. Lewis. I think it's a great book. Yes. It's a great insight into this whole world. But again, you know, when it comes to this whole topic tonight, the most important thing that one can do, going back to the comment back here, if you've been baptized and anointed with the Holy Spirit, that's where we should focus. Because if you really believe that something happened in your life when that occurred, then you have nothing to worry about with evil whatsoever. It's when people become bored with their relationship with God and think they want to need, they need more. Now, sometimes young people and I'll speak again from the Catholic perspective, will say, well, the Catholic Mass is boring. It's the same old thing. You stand, you sit, you kneel, you know. We don't know what we're doing here. And I always say, now, what did you bring to it? So if you go to a bank and you say, I'm here to make a withdrawal, and they say, well, you don't have an account here. You got nothing to withdraw. So whether you go to Catholic Mass or any other church service, it should be the culmination of your relationship with Christ throughout the week. If that hour in church is all you're giving God every week, you probably are bored. But again, you can't take something out if you haven't made a deposit. Yes. You'll be next. Yeah, so he's asking the question. There's opening yourself can be through things like the Ouija board and whatnot, but he's asking the question about drugs. I know people who work in drug enforcement, even along the border between the United States and Mexico, and they will tell you that all of the drugs that enter the United States go through satanic practices or are cursed. They go through some ritual process before they hit the street market in the United States. So your answer would be, yes, the use of illicit drugs can be a way that people are opening themselves up to evil. He's asking about the Warrens who worked with the Catholic Church and in the ministry of exorcism. I think there's always the danger that sometimes, whether it's them or others, you can begin with the best of intentions, but maybe you go a bit too far. I mean, having relics in your house of past exorcisms and all that, it's almost like you're glorifying that. 
again, we should be glorifying God and not focusing on so much on, on the evil. Evil is a reality. In the years I've done this, uh, I've known four, I think I mentioned, I don't know, to this group or beforehand, four priests who've left the priesthood who were exorcists because they just felt like they were up against so many attacks because the devil knows who's trying to defeat him, which is why those who practice any form of exorcism, whether it's a major exorcism or a minor exorcism, needs to be spiritually strong and constantly striving to grow in holiness. That's important because the devil will try to, to eat you alive. Yes. So she's asking the question, if I do an exorcism, how do I prepare myself? So I will spend time in prayer, fasting. Jesus says that certain types of demons can only be cast out through prayer and fasting. As a priest, I celebrate Mass. As a priest, I would go to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. I determine where an exorcism will be performed. It's always in a sacred space. So it's never in an abandoned house on a dead-end street. <laughs> During a thunderstorm, you know. <laughs> Makes for a great Hollywood movie. I determine who's going to be present. Exorcisms are never filmed. People that are present are not there out of curiosity. It's not a, like a tour or anything like that. It's not a show. People are there to, to be prayer warriors, if you will. So, yeah. And then the, the ritual begins by reading sacred scripture. When I pray with somebody, each session is no more than an hour just because of the number of calls and inquiries I get. The woman that was possessed with the seven demons in Leviathan, I met with her about every six to eight weeks over the course of one year. But again, that goes back to she was baptized and anointed with the Holy Spirit, but then she invited the demons into her life. So you could say that she kind of turned her back on that commitment to Christ that she made. All right. I guess my closing words are, thanks for coming out. <laughs> Don't go home and worry about the things that go bump in the night. I, th these things don't keep me up at night. I don't sleep with a nightlight on. My parish in Brownsburg, Indiana, so St. Malachi Parish is eight miles west of Indianapolis. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway is eight miles away. It's out in the country. I'm surrounded by cornfields. Coyotes prowl through the night. I can hear them out there. But I take a walk every evening. I have my Fitbit on, so I walk seven miles. <laughs> I, I walk seven miles every day. So, But I don't worry about the darkness. And there is no one else that lives around this church because it's all farmland. So it's me, and I do hear the cows across mooing every now and then. So. so don't be afraid of the devil. Just focus on the power of God, because, again, we know that the power and the authority is in the name of Jesus Christ, and if we're living under his name, then we have nothing to fear whatsoever. So on that note, God bless all of you, and have a good night. <laughs>